Our next speaker is Professor Mick Dunford. Mick is Emeritus Professor at the University of Sussex in England and Visiting Professor at the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Mick also is Managing Editor of the uh, Important Geogra Geography Journal, Area Development and Policy. So Mick, please go ahead. I'm obviously very pleased to have an opportunity to speak in, in this meeting along such uh, well-known public intellectuals as the, the other speakers. Um, I'm going to speak largely about the Chinese economy, but if one, if one looks at the US, uh, one, of, one of the most striking uh, characteristics of its evolution across the last uh, 70 or so years, and indeed of uh, G7 economies in general, is that the rate of productivity growth, the rate of labor productivity growth has progressively declined, almost progressively declined. The cyclical movements are basically a long-term downward trend, which is indicative of ex extremely weak and deteriorating economic performance. Underlying this um, downturn is in part decline in the rate of investment. And that decline in the rate of investment reflects really what is a long-term decline in profitability that itself has been accompanied by a significant growth in financial assets as a share of total assets. So the broad macroeconomic evolution of, of uh, the United States and indeed of many other Western company, uh, countries is, is one that reflects increasing, in, increasing weakness in a sense and uh, increasingly uh, ineffective growth performance. In the case of the US, you can identify four areas of um, economic strength in a way. I mean, one is the military industrial complex. The second is control of the intellectual property norm standards and rules associated with the third and fourth industrial revolutions. And in those areas, the United States still exercises a significant degree of leverage as it's applying at the moment in the case of semiconductors, for example. It enjoys exorbitant privilege as a result of the role of the dollar and as a result of its uh, ability to set the rules of the road. Yet the rise of China or the return of China actually challenges all of these areas of strength. And China, for example, talks about the problem of a deficit of peace and is anxious to establish a world of peaceful coexistence, which in, in many ways challenges the role of the US military and industrial complex. China will almost certainly play a major role in setting uh, intellectual property standards and in the next industrial revolution. So if, for example, one looks at the case of uh, artificial intelligence, in that sector, China is one of the lead, leading economies in the world already. But the impact, the impact of these new technologies really depends on the way in which they diffuse or the way in which they are applied. And in the case of the application of IT, China has enormous advantages you know, compared, for example, with, with the United States. A similar situation applies in other new, new sectors in new energy. And China produces 75% of all components. And China, the China, China accounts for, in this year, probably 60% of all the electric vehicles right, that are sold in the world. So this, this ability you know, to diffuse technologies you know, is associated with um, high rates of capital accumulation and it suggests that China will continue to sustain high rates of, of accumulation of capital. In other, in other ways, UN, UN internationalization itself also in a way poses a challenge potentially ultimately to the, the leadership of the dollar as does um, Asian integration, right, in relation to uh, the use of the dollar. And China's drive towards the establishment of a multipolar system similarly will place uh, limits on the extent to which the United States is able to set the rules of the road in the global system. So in that sense, you know, the rise of China does challenge in a serious way, the leadership of the United States, but also you know, its, its ability to sustain its uh, leadership role and its dominant position in the world. If one, if one looks at China's, uh, China's development, I think you have to remember that it reflects changing external geopolitical and geoeconomic circumstances. And it also reflects 
a series of reforms that were undertaken in China in order essentially to address the contradictions that arise at one stage of development in order to lay the foundations for new phases of growth. And if one looks at it in that way, you can identify a period in which China was embargoed by the United States and then underwent a split with the Soviet Union. But in that period, it undertook significant industrialization and made extraordinary social progress. In the early 1970s, as soon as the relationship with the United States started to improve, China immediately acquired, under Zhou, under Zhou Enlai and Mao Zedong, Western loans, it started to acquire Western technologies and equipment, and then in 1979, it embarked on reform and opening up. But in relation to uh, reform, and in particular in relation to markets, Mao had said something very significant uh, in 1975. He said, uh, at the moment, our country employs a commodity system and the wage system is unequal. Such things can only be restricted under the dictatorship of the proletariat. So in 1979, China embarked on reform and opening up and participation in what was called the Great Global Circulation. But in 1982, it passed a new constitution implementing the four cardinal principles. In 2012, one can argue that China then moved into a new, what one calls a new era after the 18th CPC National Congress and then possibly after the uh, 19th Congress. But it was also strongly shaped by the fact that from 2011, the US embarked on this pivot towards the Pacific and one moved in the direction of a new Cold War. So I want to say first that um, China's reform and opening up, which was really a part of uh, managed, managed globalization was in, econo in certain economic terms, extraordinarily successful. The, the chart at the bottom depicts the rate of growth of uh, China in the uh, first 30 years up to 1980 and then from 1980 to 2020. And you can see that China grew at 6% per year in the first period. The rest of the world, uh, excluding the Western world, grew also above the world average. But then from 1980 to 2020, China grew at 9% per year through that period on average. The rest of the world, excluding the West, grew less at a rate that was less than the world average. So you can see that while in a sense, the rest of the, of the developing world fell further behind, China made extraordinary economic progress. So in that sense, this process of managing, managed globalization was extraordinarily effective. But it involved a model of development that involved uh, specialization independent, labor intensive, largely processing industries. These activities were highly profitable for multinational companies, but it was a path that differed quite significantly from the planned economy in which China chose its own industries that it thought at that stage had significant potential. It was also the case that in this period, you know, China, China initially accumulated large trade surpluses and of course was a recipient of large inward investment, but it also uh, accumulated huge reserves. So these, 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 these dollar earnings were largely invested in US treasury bills that yielded extremely low rates of uh, return for China, in part because it was not really allowed to purchase the kind of plant and equipment that it might have wanted to develop its own industrial capabilities. Um, as far as the present situation is concerned, I mean, we know that uh, just this last year, China grew at 8.1%. Its growth actually slowed in the last quarter due to property market reform, due to its zero COVID policy, due to electricity shortages and high coal prices. But the forecast suggests that uh, China's growth in the next year or so is going to be well ahead of that of the United States, and that it will very soon, quite conceivably, um, escape the middle income trap, even though you know, the World Bank has argued that certain reforms that would be necessary in order to escape the middle income trap are reforms that China has simply not implemented. And actually, in many respects, it's moved in the opposite direction. But basically, you know, if growth 
in China exceeds that of the United States by about 1.5% per year, then by 2030, China will, will certainly be the largest economy in the world. So China's, um, China's strengths lie to some extent, or to a significant extent, in its particular economic model. And a number of those characteristics of that model need to be emphasized very strongly. One of the first is that China has a very significant state or collective sector, which accounts for something like 36% of investment. The chart on the right actually plots uh, state-owned and collective enterprises' share of uh, total investment. You can see, even though it's actually declined from the start of the new millennium, it's well over one third of total, total investment. Alongside that, China enjoys monetary sovereignty, state development banks, a public, largely public financial system, a planning system, a public innovation system, a system of land use rights assignment that drives growth, and until 2012, undertook no significant capital account opening. Growth and development, secondly, is of course market driven but government guided. Uh, you know, in recent years, the, China, the Chinese government has used industrial guidance funds worth 11.4 trillion RMB. Since 2000, China has established a significant presence in a series of medium technology industries. But of course, its goal now is to move also in the direction of high technology with measures designed to promote strategic emerging industries, new growth drivers, um, to nurture new sectors. And the aim is to concentrate on core technologies where China will secure control in its own hands, in part as a consequence to the aggression that is confronted you know, from the United States and to some extent from other Western countries. Its rate of accumulation will also continue because of urbanization. Something like 200 million people have yet to be urbanized and will be urbanized. And as they do, there'll be large investment in new infrastructure, 5G sensors, smart grids. And there will also be programs of rural vitalization, rural urban integration, which are closely related to a new strategy of, of, of dual circulation. So there is a seri series of factors which suggest that China's rate of accumulation and growth will continue to be relatively fast. These um, policies of marketization, globalization, privatization, were, however, uh, associated with the emergence of a series of quite significant problems. You know, one was a very strong increase in rural, urban, regional, and social inequalities, which are plotted in the charts on the right. They were also associated with significant environmental damage, with increases in the number of mass incidents and also with a whole series of cultural evolutions that were considered ex extremely negative. So in 1999, the Chinese government started to re-emphasize the notion of common prosperity. And it undertook a series of major counter-cyclical debt-funded investment projects that drive growth. So 3.6 trillion for the development of the Western regions, two to three trillion for old industrial areas in the Northeast, two to three trillion for central regions, over 10 trillion for the new socialist countryside from 2006 to 2015, two trillion on post Wenchuan earthquake reconstruction, four trillion for emergency market bailouts after the financial crisis. And at the same time, more recently, supply side reform alongside job creation, which involves, in a sense, a process of planned creative destruction. But China also you know, opened, had to start to open to financial capital, foreign financial capital as a result of its entry into the World Trade Organization in 2000. And in 2015, it spent 1.7 trillion to bail out the stock market. And then in August of 2015, after the renminbi exchange rate reserves declined, reserves declined by 1 trillion. And at least 500 billion of that was associated with protection of the exchange rate. And after that, quite much stricter uh, foreign foreign exchange and foreign investment, extra outgoing foreign investment controls were established. So you can see that, I mean, what I've emphasized is that China made absolutely extraordinary progress. I mean, uh, a progress that is really unprecedented in history as a result of reform after reform and opening up, but it generated a series of problems. These uh, 
Capital investments in Western regions in central China played a significant role in starting to reverse the regional inequalities by 2010. And similarly, the rural urban inequalities started to diminish after right, the end of the first uh, decade of the new millennium. Then in uh, December 2020, Xi Jinping called for a curbing of the disorderly expansion of capital. He called for a strengthening basically of domestic demand for a move in the direction of uh, ecological civilization. On uh, August the 29th, 2021, uh, Guangman Li Ice Point commentary, it was entitled, Everyone Can See That a Critical Change Is Taking Place, was republished in straight own, state owned media. And it said, the market will no longer become a paradise for capitalists to get rich overnight. The cultural market will no longer be a paradise for effeminate stars and news and public opinion will no longer be in a position of worshiping Western culture. Recently has been accompanied by a crackdown on the tech sector, on the platform economy and other monopolies, on real estate, on the financial capital, on owners seeking to get rich by going public on foreign stock markets and on wealthy elites. Housing and education, it was said, had been hijacked by capital. So the costs of education and health have exploded. They've created three mountains, right, whose rising of costs and declining affordability crowd out other types of household expenditure and limit uh, the development of fuel circulation, nationally discouraged Chinese people from having, raising children. So these, these issues are leading to reform primary, secondary, and tertiary income distribution system, and trying to establish income streams through multiple channels, establish high quality employment, lifelong education, collective wage bargaining, and increased labor compensation. Alongside that, um, China has embarked on this strategy of going out, which of course in part involves a different use of its foreign exchange reserves is involved in inward FDI, but also now in significantly in outward FDI from really from about 1999. After the financial crisis, it's been involved in currency swaps, particularly in, in East Asia. In 2013, established the Belgian Road Initiative, established the New Development Bank, the Asian Infrastructure Bank, and so on. And China has engaged in a significant extent in international lending. With, you know, the charts on the right actually depict the growth of uh, Chinese Chinese lending to different parts of the world. So if I if I just try to come to some conclusions, what I've in a sense indicated is the uh, deteriorating performance of the United States and indeed of Western economies, reflecting an under, underlying trends in profitability. And then I've argued that. China is quite likely to play a significant role in relation to the technologies of the Industrial Revolution, and that for a variety of reasons, one can envisage continuing high rates of capital accumulation. So, as Gunda Frank and Giovanni Arrighi argue, the unipolar system of Western hegemony is in decline. Asian preeminence up to the voyages of uh, Zheng He will return in the shape of a polycentric Erdogan polycentric order in which emerging countries help shape global rules. This is Renle Gontong Ti, a community of common destiny for mankind. Second, the liberal capitalist system, it seems, cannot address core contemporary governance and economic challenges, and its international legitimacy has declined in the face of the challenge of, of uh, civilization states. Neoliberalism and neoliberal globalization have run their course, eliciting deglobalization and a reassertion of sovereignty. And at the same time, one can see the beginnings of a new path of inclusive south south globalization and regionalization, of which Recep is an example. A new technological revolution is approaching and it is capable of dealing with global challenges, but exploiting its potential requires coordinated action. China itself will embark on the path of common prosperity. It will ensure continued accumulation and growth for some time to come and lay the foundations for a new phase of common development. Okay. Thank you.